Okay, this is lecture eight of algebraic geometry on the strong null Stellensatz. I should say I've changed the numbering system for lectures. So under the old system, this would have been part two, part four of lecture two. So I'll start by just recalling the weak and the strong null Stellensatz. So we're taking K to be an algebraically closed field. And we have the um, weak null Stellensatz, which states that the maximal ideals of the polynomial ring K x1 to xn just correspond to points of affine space. And we want to deduce the strong null Stellensatz, which says um, that um, I z of A is the radical of A for A an ideal in the polynomial ring. So you remember z of a was the set of zeros of the ideal a, and i of a was the ideal corresponding to this algebraic set. Um, well, um, in order to prove this, first of all, it's very easy to, show, to check that the radical of a is contained in i z of a. And the hard part is to prove is to show that i of z of a is contained in the radical of a. And we're going to use a very cunning idea due to Rabinovich called the Rabinovich trick as follows. Um, what we do is we suppose a, the ideal a is a is generated by elements f1 up to fm. And we suppose that f is an element of um, i, z of a. So we want to show that f is in the radical of a. Um, well, um, this means that F vanishes if F1 up to Fm vanish. So F1 up to Fm and one minus x naught f have no zeros in a to the n plus one. Well, what's this x naught? Well, this x naught is Rabinovich's cunning extra idea. So Rabinovich's trick is this. We add an extra variable. Kind of funny because you're proving something in n dimensions by um, jumping up to n plus one dimensions. That's kind of obvious because if any common zero would have to be a zero of f1 up to fm, so it would also have to be a zero of f, in which case this wouldn't vanish. So they have no common zeros. Now we apply the weak null Stellensatz. except we are applying the weak null Stellensatz to a n plus one. So when I said the null, weak null Stellensatz implies the strong null Stellensatz, it's really the weak null Stellensatz in one extra dimension implies the strong null, null Stellensatz in n dimensions. 
Well, the weak null stanzatz says that if they have no common zeros, um, this implies they generate the unit ideal. Um, uh, they means these elements here. Because if they have no zeros, they're not contained in any of the maximal ideals. We, we know, um, because by the weak null stanzatz, the maximal ideals just correspond to points of a n plus 1. So so we know that f1 up to fm 1 minus x naught f the ideal generated by these is just the unit ideal 1 in k x1 sorry x naught up to xn because we've added this extra variable so 1 is equal to g naught 1 minus x naught f plus g1 f plus plus g n so g m f m for some g i now put x naught equals 1 over f so we're now working in a ring of rational functions and um f1 so we find 1 is equal to g1 f1 plus g2 f2 plus g m f m where now um, all the elements g i are um, they're not quite in the ring of polynomials from x1 up to xn because they might also involve 1 over f so they're actually rational functions with denominators that can be written as powers of f now um, since each of these is rational functions with denominators of power of f, we can just clear denominators by multiplying by a high power of f. So we find f to the power of um, n is equal to h1 f1 plus h2 f2 and so on, where each hi is equal to gi times f to the n and the hi are polynomials. Um, well, this just says that f is in the radical of the ideal generated by f1 up to fn, which was what we wanted to prove. So this is the end of the proof. So um, the weak and the strong null Stellansatz give us a sort of correspondence between affine space a n and the ring k x1 up to x n so this is the coordinate ring of this affine space and remember we said earlier that anything you could do for affine space had an analog for this ring and so on and we can now fill in some of these points a1 to a n of a n correspond to maximal ideals of uh, this the maximal ideal would of course be x1 minus a1 to x n minus a n so this is the weak null stellensatz and we say that algebraic sets correspond to radical ideals These are ideals A that are equal to their own radical. So this correspondence here is the weak null Stellansatz. And this correspondence here is just the strong null Stellansatz. Um, well, you may wonder why do we, what happens for non-radical ideals? Well, 
until about 1950, most people didn't pay too much attention to the non-radical ideals unless they were doing commutative algebra. So all ideals turn out to correspond to subschemes or closed subschemes. Um, so this is something we'll see later on in the course when we do schemes that radical ideals correspond to classical algebraic sets. Um, all ideals correspond to schemes. And this is partly why you introduce schemes rather than just working with algebraic varieties. It's because you want to include all ideals. So let's see a few examples of this. So it's the first example. Let's take um, a line So this corresponds to the, this is just the line y equals naught, so it corresponds to the ideal y. And we can take a parabola which corresponds to the ideal y minus x squared. Um, so here we have two perfectly good radical ideals. And now let's look at the intersection of these, uh, of these two um, varieties. Well, you can try forming the intersection by taking the un by taking the thing generated by these two ideals. So we take the ideal y minus x squared and y. So, so this corresponds to the intersection So it corresponds at this point here. However, there's a bit of a problem because this is not radical. So it's the ideal y x squared and is not a radical ideal. Rather well, obviously, if we take the root of this ideal y x squared, it's just the point x y. And this corresponds to the point naught naught in affine space. I'm afraid notation is a bit confusing. So, so here I don't mean the point x, y. This means the ideal generated by x and y. And this is the point with coordinates 0, 0. I'm afraid left and right parentheses are a little bit overused. So they're sometimes used for ideals and sometimes used for points. And you have to figure out which is which. Um, so um, here we have a non-radical ideal turning up very naturally as the intersection of two curves. And the fact that this is this ideal is not radical kind of corresponds to the fact that if you intersect the parabola and the line, well, it sort of looks as if there's only one point there, but it's really a double point. So it ought to be counted as two points. And somehow the fact that this ideal is non-radical is trying to account for the fact there are really two points there in, the, in exactly the same place, whatever that means. For the next example, let's look at nil potent matrices. Um, in let's take all um, n by n matrices over some field K. So a matrix um, A is nilpotent if um, A to the n equals zero, where this n is the same as that n. If matrix is nil potent if some power of it equals zero, and you can see that if some power is zero, then 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 a to the n is zero. Um, so the matrices are in M and K, which we can think of as being affine space of dimension n squared. So we want to write down some natural equations for this matrix to be nil potent. Well, if a is equal to a11, a12, and so on. 
So here we have some matrix. Then A to the N will be something complicated. Um, these will be um, some homogeneous polynomials of degree N in all these coefficients here, which I'm not going to write out because they're such a horrible mess. And now we can say these generate an ideal I in the coordinate ring of A N squared. So we're just going to take all these coefficients of a to the n and say that's going to be the ideal. And in some sense, this ideal describes the set of nilpotent matrices. And now we can ask, is A, sorry, is the ideal I equal to the radical of I? Um, and the answer is no. So it's a very natural ideal. It's just the most obvious way of defining nilpotent matrices, and, and yet, yet it turns out to be not radical. In order to see this, um, um, if A is nilpotent, this implies all eigenvalues zero, which implies the trace is zero. Well, the trace is just A11 plus A22 plus A33 and so on. Well, this is not in I because I is generated by homogeneous polynomials of degree N. So you're not going to get a homogeneous polynomial of degree one over that. And not only the trace is, um, so what am I saying? Um, so, so this element here um, is in the radical of I by Hilbert's null Stellens. That's because it vanishes um, on all nilpotent matrices. Um, and not only the trace vanishes, but the sum of pairs of, um, sum of products of pairs of eigenvalues also vanishes and so on. So there are, there are quite a lot of um, things in the radical of I that are not in I. And it's um, uh, so let, let, let's take n equals two and just see what happens. So here, a the matrix A is going to have four coefficients a, b, c, d, and a squared equals zero. Well, a squared is just the matrix a squared plus b c. Um, B times A plus D, C times A plus D, and um, D squared plus B C. So the ideal I is equal to A squared plus B C, B times A plus D, C times A plus D, D squared plus B C. And we have seen that some power of A plus B is in I. So the question is, what is the, sorry, not that should be A plus D, not A plus B. So we can ask, what is the smallest power of A plus D in I? And again, it's not obvious. You might guess the answer is two, because the number two is turning up very often, but this fails. A plus D squared is not in this ideal I. In fact, we find A plus D squared is not in I, but A plus D cubed is in I. And I'll leave this as a very short exercise. So, um, you know, Hilbert's null Stellenzatz is actually telling us something that isn't at all obvious. You know, I mean, uh, it's certainly not obvious to me that some power of A plus D lies in, in this ideal. And it's, I think it's not at all obvious what the smallest power of it is, for example. I mean, um, so um, it, it's, it's um, quite a deep theorem. Um, um, the next example is the following. Well, well we looked at nilpotent matrices. What about 
commuting matrices. So let's look at the condition A, B equals B, A for A, B, both N by N matrices. And we want to find the space of matrices that commute with each other. Well, what we do is we set A equals A11, A12, etc. B equals B11, and so on. And then AB minus BA will be equal to some big matrix here. So here we have A11, B11 plus A12, B21 plus something minus something. I mean, the the coefficients are rather complicated messes. And we're going to take I to be the ideal generated by these. So I is um, in the polynomial ring of A to the 2n squared, because um, a matrix A is given by something in n squared dimensional affine space, and so is B. So here we've got um, affine space of dimension 2n squared, and we've got some ideal defining the subset of commuting matrices. And now we have the question, is I equal to the radical of I? And the answer is, well, I don't actually know what the answer is. This seems to be a very hard open problem. And the, the point of this is that it can be really difficult to find out what the radical of an ideal is. Um, I, I find this a bit surprising. I mean, um, what, what you're asking for is you're looking at the ring R over, if, you, if, you, if you've got an ideal I and you want to know whether it's, whether it's equal to its radical, you're asking whether the ring R over I have nilpotent elements. And I would have guessed that nilpotent elements in a ring are actually rather easy to find. They have this rather striking power that they have this rather striking property that some power of them is zero, which ought to make them obvious. But even in a natural example like this, it's really, really difficult to see whether the, the, the corresponding ring R over I has nilpotent elements. Um, incidentally, the space of pairs of commuting matrices in a, is a notoriously difficult space to study. Um, okay, that will be all for this lecture. I can figure out how to...